Welcome to Impact TV. It's a corporate venture video series where we showcase some of the most innovative companies and people in the world. Today, we're thrilled to have Jan Geldmacher, the president of Sprint Business, here for, for the interview. Good afternoon, Jan. Hey, Jake, how are you? Hey, thanks so much for making time. We really appreciate you carving out a little bit of time for us. And hey, we're gonna dive right in with, uh, we're gonna dive right in with questions. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about your background prior to Sprint? and let us know about you know, what professional adventures led uh, to your, your position now as the president of Sprint. Yeah, well, look, it's, um, you know, I have been in telecommunication for probably all my professional life, a couple of decades now. Started uh, with NCR and the IT on the IT side of the business, but it was then uh, immediately acquired by AT&T and became part of AT&T Group, and that's how I came into telecommunication. I was then with uh, a couple of startups in Germany, was working for Deutsche Telekom, was working for British Telekom, I was also working for Vodafone, and from Vodafone I received a call one day from Marcelo Clare, who of course the CEO of Sprint at this time, and he asked me to come over to the US and run Sprint's business uh, unit. Oh, fantastic. Hey, before we dive into the interview questions, um, I'm always looking for a good restaurant in New York, and I know that your son is a chef out there. Um, would, you, would you mind uh, mentioning uh, sort of uh, that restaurant and maybe your favorite? Uh, maybe they're one and the same. Yeah, well, I, I think there's about 17,000 good restaurants. <laughs> and then probably a couple of more in Brooklyn. And my, my son actually he works for a restaurant that is called the 11 Madison Park. He's sous chef there. And of course, because of that, we are a very you know, foodie family. And of course, what you would expect is my favorite restaurant. <laughs> Thanks for that. Diving into your activities over the last year, obviously uh, uh, there's been a, you've had this little project you're working on, $26 billion merger uh, between uh, Sprint and T-Mobile. Can you, can you, I realize there's some things that are sensitive that you can't, you can't share, but can you just tell us about your, you know, kind of last year of activities as it relates to the merger and sort of what you expect over the next year just to give you know, our viewers a little bit of insight into some of the things that you're navigating through? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, we, as probably everybody that is close to the industry knows, we have uh, signed an agreement with Dutch Telecom to mobile uh, in uh, April of last year. And since I'm trying to uh, pursue that merger between T-Mobile and the U.S. and Sprint, uh, that is a, a, a very, very big endeavor, as you said, $20 billion uh, endeavor. And it takes, uh, Quite some time because you have to go through a couple of uh, regulatory hurdles uh, to uh, get the approval. We have done that uh, on that journey. We have uh, received uh, approval from CFIUS, which is the Organization for International Investment in the United States, major international shareholders in that new potential company. We have then gone through a, a very intense phase with the QCC, the regulatory body. And got approval there, and then we uh, had a, uh, a session, a longer session, or many, many sessions with the Department of Justice to get approval from the antitrust authorities. And also, that approval is given now. We have, however, some position uh, from some of the state attorney generals that try to sue against you. And this is the next hurdle we have to overcome. So therefore, we we are trying to settle uh, or to uh, face a. Uh, a trial which is uh, terminated for December 9th and we expect a hopefully positive outcome on that and then finally get the merger done. So for me personally, that means keeping a business up and running uh, in the light and shadowed by this merger, which is uh, an additional challenge of course, but it's also lots of fun because uh, there's such a very, very huge uh, industrial logic behind that merger and customers are reacting very positively to that. When you were out in California, it was kind of you to visit last year for our, uh, or just a, I guess a few months ago, uh, for our Impact Global Venture Summit. Uh, the keynote that you delivered on 5G was fascinating and very well received by the audience. Just to capture it here, can you talk about some of the you know, main differences between 4G and 5G and what has you so excited as you know, one of the world's experts in 5G? Yeah, look, I think that you know, we, we have educated our customers and stakeholders in the industry that every G that comes out from 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G increases the speed of the network and increases the download and upload capabilities and increases the capacity of the network. 
And of course, that also happens with 5G. So we will have higher speed, we will have higher upload, higher download speed. We have uh, probably a bigger reliability of the network. We have less uh, uh, battery consumption of the devices. But I think one uh, factor that really makes a very big difference from 4G to 5G is the lower latency that 5G would provide. So if you if you if you look into latencies, the latencies would go down probably to uh, uh, you know a, a number that is below uh, 10, 9, 8 milliseconds, and that is a tremendous new uh, kind of feature that comes to the market with 5G that enables lots of new business models like autonomous applications, like uh, robotic applications, drone applications powered by artificial intelligence and machine learning. So that's why I'm so excited about 5G. One of the things that we do as a venture firm is try to pay particularly close attention to innovations by, by corporations, sort of the areas of need, the areas where they're getting traction. Uh, and so I, I not only appreciated learning a little bit about sort of your view on 5G, but um, you know, you're starting to get some real traction with the, the new initiative around Curiosity IoT. Can you, can you provide us with kind of an overview on um, why you're enthusiastic about that, how you know, your customers are responding to some of the innovative things that, that Sprint is doing with Curiosity IoT? Yeah, if you, if you take again the, this low latency as a new feature or a feature that uh, highlights in 5G, of course that has a relevance also for uh, the classical consumer handset business. For example, when you think about gaming, you know, get, doing an online game on a handset without having actual data loaded onto the handset gives you a complete new experience in gaming. But I think uh, the, uh, the real uh, differentiation comes in the IoT space when you connect things, when you connect things at a latency that uh, uh, kind of copies the latencies that we experience in our own body by, for example, connecting uh, the uh, senses that we have to our brain and seeing how fast the reaction of the body happened. Now we can replicate that, um, that in the network by uh, creating latencies between data center in the edge and the device uh, in the IoT world that uh, reflects actually the, uh, the latencies in the body, which is super exciting. Just think about autonomous applications where, where cars uh, or vehicles in general or, or objects that are uh, traveling in, in traffic uh, need to react at least as good as humans would react in order to avoid uh, traffic jams but also avoid accidents. So that's super exciting. Yeah, very interesting. We are, you know, we've invested in a company called Cornami, which is in the high performance computing space, you know, addressing uh, the responsiveness of uh, autonomous vehicles uh, as one of their market applications. We, you know, we've also uh, invested in a company in the robotic space that's actually uh, picking fruit and sort of, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of different sort of innovations out there with these autonomous tractors and vehicles. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting space. We're, we're regularly looking as a venture fund to um, collaborate with large corporations and their corporate venture groups. Is there any advice that you have for a firm like ours or others in the venture industry for how best to sort of collaborate? I mean, we're sharing market insight, where we're, you and I have looked at you know, uh, deal flow opportunities uh, together, investment opportunities together, uh, you know, those, those types of things. We're, we're looking at where um, you know, Sprint and others are investing and acquiring companies, we're trying to pay attention. Do you have any advice for us as a, as a venture fund that's looking at expanding its network of, of corporates and how we might be able to provide value? Yeah, well, I think it's important that we create an ecosystem between those uh, carriers like Sprint or others and uh, the innovation that comes from startups and from venture-funded uh, companies and entrepreneurs because, you know, the tradition of uh, uh, telcos is not necessarily to come up with the latest application. And I think, therefore, we believe and spread that the, the, the ecosystem between entrepreneurs in the market uh, and spread as an enabler from a technology perspective uh, make a lot of sense. And you mentioned Konami, so, uh, uh, or you mentioned uh, other adventures that you have in, in your fund, uh, other investments that you have in your fund. And, you know, all of them are working at the end of the day in the same ecosystem in different specialities. For example, you know, the chipset tries to reduce the latency within the machine that we want to connect to a low latency network. We want to, at the same time, roll out an edge computing application to overcome, uh, you know, physics, which is still, um, you know, based on latency, still is based on distance, 
between two objects. And all of that together, then, at the end of the day, enables a new application. And that's why we, as, as Sprint, are very open to team up and partner with innovations that come from these entrepreneurs that do our funding. And therefore, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good match to work together in that, in that area. And when it comes to very concrete and very specific advice here, I, I would say everything that uh, powers autonomous robotics and artificial intelligence is probably the stuff that we should look at right now because this is all enabled through 5G networks uh, in terms of translating that into real applications uh, for, uh, for the markets uh, today, but also for the markets to come. Let's talk a, a little bit about artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, you mentioned it. Um, in my experience, in the early days of the internet, I think many people were sort of viewing it as quarantined to a new technology sector, not necessarily looking at the application of the internet to every sector. I think AI is going through a little bit of an evolution now as effectively more and more uh, connectivity happens around the world, as more and more content gets uploaded and, and more and more sort of pattern recognition for decision making happens. AI seems to be, uh, it be it's becoming relevant to every sector. Uh, not necessarily quarantined to, to one area. And I, I guess no, no more evidence of that than SoftBank, a group that obviously you're close to with a $108 billion fund, uh, the largest venture fund I think ever created, uh, laser focused on AI. Can you talk a little bit about kind of your view of artificial intelligence and some of the innovations in that space that you're most excited about? Yeah, well, I, I, I'm excited about artificial intelligence because it, it, it is uh, you know, capable of disrupting established industries and established business models. And it can disrupt it in, in two different ways, I think. So it either can disrupt it in terms of coming up with an alternative play to establish business models, or it can help establish business models to survive in the age of disruption against maybe new market entrants if you adapt it in, a, in the right way. I, I see that happening in all industries. There's no industry that is basically excluded. If you take healthcare, you can see a AI driven or machine learning driven uh, automated uh, diagnostic services that we can deploy these days. If you uh, if you go to the insurance of industry, it's, it's it's pretty obvious you know what AI can do in order to detect and to determine risks uh, that you take. You you go to autonomous applications where AI uh, algorithms predict uh, uh, you know traffic and developments. So whatever to pick as an industry, you will find. Uh, you know, AI or machine learning uh, potentially disrupting uh, the industry. That's, that's exciting and that's how the Vision Fund uh, obviously invests as, as well. Yep, amazing stuff. I agree. Hey, I, uh, just out of respect for your time, we just have a couple of minutes left here. Uh, can I shift gears and ask you a few personal questions, John? Just, I guess, from a professional development standpoint, um, we, you know, I interact quite closely with uh, the entrepreneurs organization, and I'm involved in a chapter out here in Sacramento. And many of, of the groups are constantly looking for ways in which they can sharpen their business game, professional development strategies, other things. And and so, you know, we have unique access to you today. It'd be interesting just to hear your perspective on how do you say, how do you stay sharp from a professional development standpoint to sort of, you know, bring your A game to, to sprint business every day. Well, that's uh, probably that is something that I do intuitively, not so much planned and not so much in a, in a strategic way. I, I just uh, probably am curious as a person and like to, to learn and like to understand uh, new things that I'm facing. And if I don't understand them immediately, I try to find somebody who can explain to me how it works. And this is how I stay on top of things. I also like to test out things. And, and not only look at them from a theoretical point of view, and that's I have done that all my life, and uh, hopefully can continue on that path. So it's not so much a strategic approach; it's more a gut-driven approach that I follow. Well, speaking of that, that does make a lot of sense. Uh, speaking of sort of curiosity, you you may recall that I I have some research that I'm doing on strategic planning for life and sort of how people are. Uh, sort of adopting new routines to bring sort of a physical and mental A game to each day. Do you have a morning routine that sort of optimizes your sort of alignment and activities for that day with, with you know, business objectives, personal objectives that you're trying to achieve that day? Is there something you do in the morning that's a regular routine that you think supports your efforts? 
Not really, to be honest. So I, if, you, if you don't call it a routine that I jump on my subway every morning to drive three stops to my sprint office <laughs> to wait, order my, uh, my, my coffee at Starbucks and pick it up uh, when I go to the office. So that's my routine. But then I'm, I'm hitting the office and you know I'm in the middle of my, my business day. And I like that so uh, in that way. And that, uh, I mean, let's, let's face it, I, I think these, these routines that people give themselves are very often routines that they need in order to distract from the from the from the from the hectic business of the day. And for me, the hectic business of the day is what I really like. Therefore, I, I don't need that routine in that way. <laughs> That's great feedback. Hey, last question for you: Are there are there blogs that you read? Uh, key uh, sort of industry publications. Uh, some place that some some recent book that that uh, that you that you'd suggest has, has recently uh, influenced you. Anything that uh, you've read or or watched recently that's that's really had an impact on you professionally or personally. Well, I mean, there's always these great recommendations of books that then nobody reads, right? So I won't do that. So what, what I what I could recommend to my uh, German-speaking uh, fellows is. Uh, to listen to the Hundreds Blood news blog, which I do every morning, and you call that a routine, maybe that is a routine. And then there's, uh, there's news blogs uh, that keep me close to an outside in view uh, with a perspective that is not a US perspective. So my recommendation maybe would be then translated in, you know, when you want to have a real picture of the world, don't use only one source of the domestic place you are in, use sources from all over the world to augment the picture that you have. And I use German news blogs in order to do that, but I also read other, other newspapers and, 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 and sources of information in order to, to, uh, to basically augment the picture I'm getting when I consume news, be it industry news or political news, from US sources. Yep, I see. Thanks so much for your time today. Appreciate the opportunity to, to um, learn from you about some of the things that are happening in your industry, some of the things that, that you do personally and professionally. I really appreciate the, uh, the time today and we'll, we'll definitely have to reconnect with you in 2020 for a, for a follow-up interview. Uh, but thanks again for carving out the time today, Jan. Looking forward to that. Thank you very much for having me.